good morning, FCC. Welcome to FCC Online. We're grateful that you are here and that you've tuned in today. Uh, super excited about the opportunities of, again, unpacking the book of Galatians and looking forward to our opportunities. So glad that you've tuned in today. So today we are in Galatians chapter 3, and we are looking through the entire chapter, looking at the question, what makes a person good? And so many of us have tried on our own efforts to become the people that we need to be, and quite frankly, we fall very short. Trying to do things by our own efforts, by our own good, by our own way of earning. But God has such a different plan, and Paul is trying to help the church in Galatia with that and helping each of us with that as we kind of battle through our own kind of anxieties that we have to be performance-oriented. And uh, looking forward to the opportunities of unpacking that and again finding our lives transformed by God's Word letting ourselves see what it is that we need and if nothing else maybe it's something that we could use to help someone else with in their faith journey but let's pray about what God's going to do as we get started this morning Lord we thank you so much for every person who's tuned in here online and looking forward again to what it is you're going to do in impacting our lives well, we really truly believe that scripture is God-breathed and God, God ordained, and we're challenging our lives to be open to what it is that we need to hear, that you'll breathe life into us, and that we will begin to understand better again this grace picture that you've given. We thank you again for the impacting power of the Savior. We thank you again for how he has come and loved us no matter where we are. And thank you again for him taking care of all the things that we try to work so hard at and allowing it to be placed in our faith in Christ Jesus. So be with us on this journey today, God. We thank you for being the good God you are, for the ways that you are. We cannot think of a, a better way to be able to say the wonder of God is in our midst today. So be with us in all we do and say, God, that um, we would be changed and challenged and that we would be moved to be drawn closer to you. Be with us now as we open up your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's get started today, church. So this morning as we open up God's word and look at Galatians Explained, we're looking at what makes a person good today in Galatians chapter 3. I start with this story. There's a story of a young student at Cambridge University who entered the classroom on an exam day and asked the proctor who was giving the test to bring him cakes and ale. The proctor refused, expressing astonishment at the young student's audacity. At this point, the student opened up the 400-year-old Laws of Cambridge, which were written in Latin and still nominally in effect. And the passage read, as he read it, gentlemen sitting for examinations may request and require cakes and ale. Well, the proctor was forced to comply. It was decided that Pepsi and hamburgers were the modern equivalent, and so the necessary accommodations were made for the student. After all, the law was on his side. Well, three weeks later, that same student was summoned to the Office of Academic Affairs to face disciplinary action and was ass assessed a fine of five pounds. He was not fined for demanding cakes and ale, but for blatantly disregarding another obscure Cambridge law. And here's that law. He had failed to wear a sword to the examination. <laughs> trying to, you know, trying to manipulate the law, the law for our own purposes, can really be tricky and can somewhat be costly. If you really want to be identified with the law, when the law comes back your direction, doesn't always work out so well. And the law is what sometimes want, is wanting to dictate us to be better than we are, to improve the person that we are. That if I can just own up and do better things, I can earn the salvation thing that happens. Well, as we've been looking at Galatians, I would say that the first two chapters, uh, chapters one and two, are right, really the personal section. Paul telling us personally what was going on in his life, what was happening in the life of the disciples, it was a personal section. But when we get to chapters 3 and 4 of Galatians, we're going to look at the doctrinal section. section the, the section that actually talks about our belief and why we believe it. And then chapters 5 and 6, as we get to those later on in the coming weeks, will be the practical section. The section that, how do we put all this stuff into purpose and place? 
Well, again, when we're asking this question, what makes a person good, I'm going to, uh, if we can today, take a look at five different pieces or six different pieces of what is the way to making a good person? How do we, how, is there a way to make that happen? Well, we find out that that's not necessarily the case as we take a look at Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to look at it a little at a time as we open it up. And let me just say it this way first. The entire Christian way is about living out faith, not performance. Living out faith, not performance. We're going to see it in verses 1 through 3 of Galatians 3. Let's look at that together if we could. It says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit? After, be, after, after beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? See, the entire Christian way is about living out our faith and not performance. Paul begins this passage by saying, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He's saying, in essence, are you completely out of your mind? Like, what in the world are you thinking? He's looking at the Galatians and he's unable to believe their behavior. He just can't, he can't get past the idea that they've even gotten to this spot. Paul called them bewitched. J.B. Phillips said that same in his translation, said, this, said it these words, Oh, dear idiots. And in the message version, it says, You crazy Galatians. And one writer suggests numbskulls. Paul wanted to know who bewitched them. It's the Greek word that comes from the realm of black magic and refers to a spell or a hex or an evil eye. What makes you and me good enough to get to heaven. Now you may say, I'm pretty good on a relative scale of goodness. Surely I'll go to heaven. And that's always easy for us to be able to say when we compare ourselves typically to people that are not near as good as you are. And that's what God, that's not what God does at all. When, when God makes a comparison, he compares you to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. We are all going to fall short of the divine glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 is clearly defined. There is no way when you compare my life to Jesus' life that I'm anywhere close to where he's at. Actually, the, the idea here is that none of us are perfect, and how could any of us be saved? Well, it says in the text that we were made right. You and I are made right, and we were made right, if, as he said, before their very eyes, before their very eyes. Now, Paul is saying that before their very eyes, they literally saw Jesus hung on the cross for their redemption some 17 or 18 years earlier. Uh, that's not possible, right? Were they actually there? No. Actually watching the death of Jesus on the cross might mean nothing, but hundreds, if not thousands, saw Jesus dying on the cross, and most of them only mocked him. And then we have this phrase, publicly portrayed, publicly seen, publicly crucified. It's an interesting Greek word which demonstrates how they had been given the truth of Christ so convincingly that in their mind's eye they saw it for what it was, the absolute truth. In fact, the word used for betrayed or publicly betrayed is the Greek word prographo. And the, the, the suffix is grapho. It's where we get our English word graphic. Something that can be seen clearly. The crucifixion of Christ Jesus was right in front of them. It was a graphic display. And just so we're clear, the law knows. No, it, it does nothing but show you and me that you and I need a Savior. When we put the law right next to our lives, all it does is say, how in the world could I ever make it without a Savior? The word promised is used eight times in today's scripture verse. And these uses of promise refer to God's promise to Abraham that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. The promise involved being justified by faith, having all of the blessings of salvation. The promise of Abraham came hundreds of years before the law was given. The Judaizers were teaching that giving 
that giving of the law changed that original covenant promise. But Paul argues that it didn't. And the law needs to help us to see that we need a Savior in, in our lives. That you and I cannot do it without him. D.L. Moody used to say it this way. He was glad that, he was, that we are not saved by our good works. Because he didn't want to sit in heaven listening to people brag about how they got there. Uh, I couldn't agree more. You know, we need, we need to run and find ourselves right to the cross, clinging to the cross, because that's the only way we're going to be able to get to heaven. You and I are saved by grace through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. And to think otherwise means we're going to be hoodwinked. We're going to be befuddled. We're going to be bewitched. And let's not be, be the foolish bewitched like Galatians. Let's not be led astray thinking that we can save ourselves for good what good works. Salvation is a gift, folks, and you have to receive it. Well, then we come to the second point today that really kind of helps us with, with this whole idea of what makes a person good, the way to getting that done. It's the way it has always been. What we look at in the past has always been this way. Look at verses uh, 6 through 9. It says, Consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was considered to him credited as righteousness. Understand that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would testify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you, so that those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. I want you to know it's always been that way because it's been that way since Abraham. Paul writes, just as Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. And when we look at Abraham's life, what should we learn? That you could focus on, on Abraham as an example of good works? He picked up and he moved when God told him to. He was ready to give up his son when God asked him to. Was Abraham saved because of his good stuff that he did? Is it the lesson that you're supposed to take away from his life? No. Paul says Paul was saved exactly the same way that Abraham was saved. He was saved by grace through faith, and through faith he was counted righteous before God. And so I would just challenge you folks to be like those of faith. Whenever you read people about people in the Word of God, would you not see them as anything except people who lived by faith? Abraham was not saved by his good works. He was saved by the grace that he trusted in God. And his faith was counted to him as righteousness. And Paul is saying that Abraham was saved exactly the same way we were. By God's grace, not by his own righteousness. And God has operated this way. And there are only two ways to get to God. There is only one way. There are not two ways to get to God. There's only one way. And it's through faith. Not through good works. And that's why we need faith if we're going to belong to Abraham's family. Abraham and every other person that we read in Scripture, we could call a hero, is actually a recipient of God's grace. And this completely changes the way that we read Scripture. Instead of seeing biblical people who are good enough, you should begin to see them as people who weren't good enough, who trusted God. And the Bible communicates that you and I grow through faith, and it does so from start to finish. But let's move on in our text as we see this third piece, and that is that there can be no other way to get there except the way that God has planned. Look at verses 10 through 14. Verse 10 says, All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous, the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing being to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the law. You know, when I see that there's no other way except that Christ comes, we need to understand that your ways are always going to fall short. And that's why it's so important for, for us to get that in our head. If you try to live the Christian life by your own strength, you're going to end up condemned. 
You're never going to measure up. Your efforts to keep God's law are always going to fall short. And God pronounces a curse on all who fail to keep the law and their requirements. Deuteronomy chapter 27, if we were to go back, look at verse 26. It says, Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And when the Levite prophet said this to the people, the people responded, Amen, and so be it. But that leaves us all in big trouble, folks. Those who do everything required by the law are cursed. No one does everything, everything required by the law. And therefore, trying to earn God's approval through keeping the law leads to a curse. Well, I'm going to ask you, as I get my communion ready, that you would get yours ready. Because it's at this point that we're going to talk about this cursed moment that happened with our Savior, Christ Jesus. And it's at that point that we find out that we are absolutely loved. And I'm just here to tell you, if you hear nothing else from me today, I want you to know that you are loved. You're loved so much that Jesus was willing to become a curse in your place. The bottom line is that you and I are loved by God and there's nothing you can do to keep him from doing that to you. God chooses to love you even though you don't feel like you deserve it. And that is informational pieces that, I, I can't, I quite frankly, we have to say, it is the good news. You and I are under a curse and the only way that curse is removed is through what Christ has accomplished by his blood given at the cross. Jesus became cursed in our place. He received your curse so that you could receive his blessing. You have all the blessings of being Abraham's spiritual descendants through Christ. Nothing else is necessary. And it begins with the cross. It begins when we hear the gospel message of what Christ has accomplished on the cross. It continues the same way. You don't progress in your Christian life by pulling yourself up by your own effort. It's how we grow in our Christian life, not on our own steam, but through the Spirit, enabledly working out what Jesus did at the cross. I don't know about you, but as we take our communion today, I'm so grateful that you and I are not the ones that are cursed because of what it is we've done. He became cursed for us. Let's take a few moments and just remember the incredible thankfulness we should have in our hearts knowing that we are not a cursed people. Now, Lord, I thank you so much for the moment when we get to have, when we get to raise bread to our mouth and remind ourselves again about an incredible love of a Savior who'd be willing to take a curse, not just my curse, not just, not just what, what, what belongs to me, but you are willing to take the curse for all of us. And all of the curses are upon you. It's why God had to turn his back for a moment in darkness. He could not look upon his son. And Lord, we come thanking you again for this extended piece of grace that's handed to us. As we drink from the cup and we remember again and thankful again about your shed blood, which has just stained us from top to bottom. We are covered by that blood. Thank you again for redeeming us in the way that you did. Help us now to remember in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, family, would you take this bread and remember again the body of our Savior as we eat and take it together? And then would you remember again his blood that was shed on our behalf to give us life everlasting? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, and our fourth piece, again, about what it looks like when we try to make ourselves good before God instead of understanding the grace that he's given to us, let's take a look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 20, where we find a promised way is kept. Look at verse 15. It says, Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life, just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that was, has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And the scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is in Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God. 
and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then no longer depends on a promise. But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. What then was that purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels and by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not re represent just one party, but God is one. And so there's this promised way that's kept. The promise was of one seed being from the, the seed, the mediator. Now Paul clarifies the point of this illustration. God made a covenant with Abraham. The covenant was a one-way promise by God to bless Abraham and his offsprings in a specific way. But the Judaizers were apparently telling people that the law replaced God's covenant promise of Abraham. That Paul soundly rejects that idea. It's in the last verse that Paul made a point of indicating that this promise was given to Abraham's singular offspring, not a plural group, group or collection of many. Judaism had always believed that the promises given to Abraham would one day be fulfilled in a single person, a Messiah, the mediator. Now, Jesus was Abraham's ultimate offspring. He received those covenant promises made to Abraham. And that's why all who trust in Christ's death for their sin, placing their lives in Christ, also receive the blessings promised to Abraham's offspring. We receive whatever Jesus is entitled to because we have been given credit to his sinless life. He has taken the penalty for our sinfulness. So what does that mean? It means that the law can't change the promise. Verses 15 through 18 make it clear. Paul used the illustration of human covenants or agreements that we make in everyday life. And we all understand that, that once two parties make an agreement, a third party can't come along years later and change that agreement. The only persons you can change are, are the original agreeers, those who were first there. And for anyone else to add anything else or take any way from the original agreement would be illegal. Well, in the final analysis, God made his covenant promise with Abraham. Now, the law of Moses, that came, as he explained, 430 years later, that cannot alter the covenant. And certainly the Judaizers of Paul's day cannot change the original covenant we can imagine the Judaizers pr pr proposing, suppose a later revelation such as the law of Moses was greater or more glorious than the earlier one. What then? Well, the law can't change the promise. But then we also see this in verse 19 and 20, that the law isn't greater than the promise. The account given of the law in the Old Testament was indeed impressive. Exodus chapter 19 tells us that there was a thunder and lightning then that the people trembled. That was rather a dramatic event compared to the calm giving of the covenant of Abraham. Nevertheless, Paul points out that the law is inferior to the covenant promise in two ways. First, he noticed that the law was temporary. Points out that it was added until the offspring should come in verse 19. With the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, the law has done away with it. You will remember what Jesus was about to die. He declared it is finished in John chapter 19. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 14, Paul exclaimed, explained, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it, nailing it to the cross. See, therefore we get, we get the idea that the law was really just a temporary, a temporary role. But secondly, we also see that the law required a mediator. And we've already kind of talked about that when God uh, gave the law to Israel. He did it by means of angels and through a, mediator, a mediation of, of, of Moses. In other words, Israel received the law third hand, from God to angels to Moses. But when God made his covenant with Abraham, he did it personally without a mediator. And so that points that Paul was making it clear. The promise was greater than the law for two reasons. The law was temporary. And it required a mediator. The promise was permanent and needed no mediator. Therefore, the promise was greater than the law. Point five is my probably my favorite part of the text here today because of what it says. As we find out that your way, the way that you wanted to do it, 
he was arrested. It was arrested by Christ's death on the cross. Look at verse 21 through 25 of our text today. It says, Is this the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith could be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith. And now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of law. Man, praise be to God, your way was arrested by his death. And it says in the text that we were locked up. Well, what are we locked up to? I think we're locked up to trials. We find ourselves bound by them. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, talks about this strange thing that he was concerning, the fiery trials that we would have. Some of us have been locked up by our trials. And what are some of those trials? Trials of disappointment? We've certainly been experiencing that. Trials of distress? Trials of rebellion? Trials of overwhelming sorrow? Sorrow and then trials of loneliness. But then we can, we can go even further and say there are trials about death. Death of, of the thing that we've loved, the person that we've loved, the finances that we've had that we don't have anymore, the opportunities we once have that we don't have. Death to, the, uh, to an idea or even death to what we used to have. And there's also the trials of challenges. Challenges like sins and addictions and helplessness and hopelessness. See, the power of the gospel can only be fully exhibited in a Christian who's subject to some great trial. It's okay that trial comes our way. It kind of locks us up for a moment so that later God can come by and unlock it because of the power of Christ. But we're also locked up in our doubts, not just in our trials. Some of you have been in a storm for a long, long time, and you have been waiting on God and waiting for you and me is just catastrophic. We can't stand it. It's because, folks, we live in a microwave kind of world where we get instantaneous results and we don't have a microwave God. We have a crock pot God. He slowly simmers and he cooks in our life what needs to happen and so we wait. I know we're tempted to give up, maybe even lower our expectations, but I'm just challenging church family. Don't Give up on God. Isaiah chapter 64 verse 4 says, Since ancient times no one has heard, no ear has received, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait on him. And so we are locked up in our trials, we're locked up in our doubts, but then we find in this text that we're locked up until faith. Once faith comes, we're not locked up anymore. Faith accepts difficulty with an attitude of gratitude. And you know by faith that God will begin to send you blessings. He'll begin to send you help and reveal the truth that you needed to hear. Listen to all the places where God causes blessings to be locked up until faith came. We have Moses locked up in the desert, attempting to deliver Israel in his own strength until faith. Paul and Silas were locked up in prison physically until faith. The nation of Israel was locked up in the wilderness for 40 years until faith. Isaac locked up in Abraham until faith. Israel was locked up between the Red Sea and the charging army until faith. Jericho was locked up until faith. I was locked up in my own sin until faith. And faith honors God and God honors faith, and faith turns a promise into prophecy, and by faith I've been made whole. You and I can be made whole, and we can receive our breakthrough. Matthew chapter 9, verse 29 says, According to your faith it will be done unto you. And in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, it says, This is the victory that overcomes the world, our trials, even our faith. But then I always have this last piece in regards to this piece 
that we've been locked up. But I just want you to know there is a time when you get out. It is after that faith moment that you find yourself free from the things you used to be free from, that you used to be locked up to. And it's because death was arrested. We sing that song sometimes, even in our worship service. Here's just one verse and one part of the text from that song. Release from my chains. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom that he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free, it washes over me. You have made me new and now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new. Now new life begins with you. Oh, we're free, the song says. We're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free, forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began. See, death was arrested by Christ Jesus, church family, and you are no longer locked out of life, but not faith, but Jesus. And so, folks, as we uh, kind of come to a close and we're on our last point here, we're looking at verses 26 through 29 and looking at the way to a relationship is through the one, the one in Christ Jesus. And I want to take a moment, if I can, to just point you to a couple of baptisms that have happened here in the couple of months. And uh, two of them that you're going to see right away. One in Sandy Klein and one in Sandy Woodward. Uh, would you take a look at the screen and again just watch in the excitement of what it is we're getting ready to read. You see those verse, the verses that we're getting ready to read in verses 26 through 29 are what you've just watched and happened in front of you. Look at verses 26 through 29 of our text today. It says, For... You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You are all sons of God. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And there is neither Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to to that promise. That is the gospel good news for you. And I just want you to hear all of what you saw in these videos and these folks that were baptized. One in Sandy Klein. Sandy Klein is in hospice care right now and in that spot said, I, I still want to be baptized. And as we took her to the baptistry, it was like it was like the sensation of us breaking through the roof and lowering her in front of Jesus. And there was a moment when the family gathered around and Sandra had the church family gathered around. Even with the brain tumor, she's saying, I want this washing and this cleansing. And even this, this last week, we had one of our younger ones who, who came forward, uh, one of the hardest children came forward and said, uh, I want to be baptized. And their dad baptized them. And all of them, all three of them, just so we're clear, have become sons, which means, according to this text, all who are baptized become part of the family. In baptism, you see there's a relationship for everyone. It's not left to just a few or to just those who have been chosen. It says in the text that we were clothed together. Baptism reminds us that we're clothed with the same way. Nobody gets special garments. You get one that looks different than somebody else. Nobody gets anything special. We're all washed the same way. We get clothed with the same garment as everyone else. No special clothing for any special people. In fact, it says in the text, there are no distinctions, just one people because of the one in Christ Jesus. At baptism, you become common. You don't get a higher position or rank than anybody else. There are no differences any longer. Nobody is more important than anybody else. And the last part of this text reminds us that you and I, in baptism, we belong. In baptism, you have a place. You have no longer are without a place of fellowship, without a place of kinship. It actually says that we're heirs to the same promise given to Abraham. Now that is exciting news. What you watch and what you see makes all of us exactly the same. Exactly the same. Well, I, I close with this illustration as we close our time today. In the early 1930s, the U.S. had had a problem. Crime had become a muck and the prohibition of alcoholism in the 1920s had given rise to all kinds of pervasive organized crime. And a frightened public demanded a response, and the government wanted to send 
a message to criminals. Their message was named Alcatraz, often referred to as The Rock because of its location out on the island just outside of San Francisco. Alcatraz is this tiny island listed on a rock. It was a military prison. From 1933 to 1963, Alcatraz had a federal prison and housed some of our nation's most notorious outlaws, including Al Capone. And during its 30 years of operation, the penitentiary claimed that no prisoner successfully escaped. A total of 36 prisoners made uh, 14 escape attempts, two men trying twice, 23 were caught, six were shot and killed during their escape, two drowned and five of them were listed as missing and presumed drowned. Alcatraz, also called The Rock, was one of the most, one of the most successful examples ever of an escape-proof prison. But there is one prison that's even more inescapable, and it's the one referred to in the verses from Galatians that we've studied here today. It's the bondage of sin and the bondage of law. And as you've seen, the false teachers called Judaizers were teaching that the way to escape sin shackles was through obedience to a strict set of rules known as the law of Moses. And Paul's response to these teachers is that the law is not a way to escape the bond of his sin. Rather, faith in Christ, trusting in his sacrifice on the cross as a payment for sin is the only way to be set free from the bondage of sin. Our sin bound us, and the law keeps us shackled still. But Christ sets us free. And Paul said it well in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ, because the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death, especially and ultimately because Jesus is the rock that sets us free from inescapable prison like the rock, the prison of sin and law. We are set free so that we can be one with God and experience oneness with Him and we can experience life in His name. And so church family, I just want to remind you one more time that you can escape from the prison of sin and it is from the rock, Christ Jesus, who sets you and me free. Would you lean into that? Would you respond to that? And would you say yes to that today? Hey there, church family. I'm so grateful again that you've tuned in today, and I want you to know that you still have that opportunity to have these open discussions about your walk with Christ. I know it sounds like it's a big confusing thing, but it really isn't. We've made it more complicated than it needs to be. If you are in a spot where you're walking this journey and you have questions, we want to answer them. We want to help you with them, and we want to help you walk through those. Um, but again, as we close our time here today, uh, could I just share a couple of verses with you, uh, again, from our text that we've just heard, and again, remind us again of who it is you and I are in Christ Jesus uh, before we begin to pray. So listen to these two verses as we close our time. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for adopting us as your children, for making us your heirs, for allowing us to be exactly the same. There is no believer in Christ that is above another. We have all need to be redeemed from the curse that has been given to us. And we are again, one more time, grateful again that you became the curse in our place that you took on all of what it is that we had on ourselves and you took it upon yourself. We thank you for the redemption and freedom that we have. But we thank you most of all now for that place of inheritance that you've allowed us to be part of. Thank you for including us, for capturing us because of your incredible love for us. And I pray, God, that if there's anybody that's just outside of that right now and they believe that they're unlovable, that they're unworthy, that they have bought into the lie that they can't be redeemed. Oh, Lord God, I would pray that your spirit would prick their heart and that they would find themselves drawn closer to a God who truly loves, who wants to give hope and peace into their life. We love you and thank you now and praise you again for the chance to be able to worship you. In a few moments, God, we're going to say amen, and we will now go to worship. So I pray, God, that our lives would be reflective of what it is we're supposed to do and how much we want to honor you. 
Be with us now on this journey. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a great week.